Hello, and welcome to this exclusive interview with a truly illustrious guest today. My name is Andres Jain, current research analyst and former program editor with the NATO Association of Canada. But you are not here for me. Our guest is a former Canadian cabinet minister. I'll be keeping the introductory remarks a bit short as we've got a lot of ground to cover, but make no mistake that our interviewee is a man very tall in stature indeed. I am pleased to introduce the Honorable Bill Graham, five-time Member of Parliament between 1993 and 2007, who acted as Canada's Minister of Foreign, under Foreign Affairs under Prime Minister Jean Chrétien and Minister of National Defence under Prime Minister Paul Martin. He holds degrees from the University of Toronto and the University of Paris, and before entering Parliament, he was an acclaimed professor in international trade and international law. Towards the end of his political career, he even briefly served as the interim leader of the Federal Liberal Party. Under Minister Graham's first cabinet tenure, he oversaw Canada's entry into the NATO-led International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF, in Afghanistan, all the way back in 2001 and 2002. Of course, we ended up staying there until 2014 under Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper. Indeed, Afghanistan and the war in Afghanistan is the primary subject of our conversation today. We will be touching on themes of Canada and Afghanistan, Canada-NATO relations, NATO interoperability, peace building, international law, and the current state of the Afghan peace process. Minister Graham, I hope you are keeping healthy in these uncertain times. Thank you sincerely for agreeing to this okay. interview with the NATO Association of Canada. Well, thank you very much, Anish. It's, I'm a great admirer of what uh, you young people are doing with the NATO Association and you interns and you're making it very may, making it very relevant to the younger population of our country, which is so important. You know, security is not something that we discuss very much as Canadians, and yet it should be top of mind in today's very complicated world. So the work the NATO Association does is, is important that way. So I wish you well with it. Thank you so much. My first set of questions is regarding NATO and the alliance's unity going into Afghanistan. I was hoping you could expound on some of the questions that were being asked of the Alliance at the time, particularly its place in the world just a decade after the fall of the Soviet Union. So did Afghanistan renew NATO's purpose in 2001 and did that purpose even need renewing? Well, that's, a, you know, that's a, an interesting question, the way you phrase it, because um, I don't know that I would say it renewed uh, NATO's purpose. It certainly took it in a different direction, because as you know, we, we, when we went to Afghanistan, NATO, it was decision for an out of theater uh, move by NATO. So in that sense, it was a dramatic uh, departure from the traditional role of NATO. Um, when, when I got originally involved in NATO, uh, although as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee at the House of Commons, we were often uh, engaged in NATO affairs and particularly looked at the question of nuclear policy relating to NATO when I was the chairman of the committee. But uh, when I became foreign minister, uh, the, the expansion towards the East was being completed. The former uh, Soviet countries of Hungary and Poland were becoming NATO members. Uh, there was a real push to establish better relations with the, the former Soviet Union, with Russia. I attended the NATO summit in Rome with Mr. Putin, Mr. Bush, Mr. Gretchen, et cetera. So there was a real, uh, there was in a sense that NATO had a real purpose. Uh, there was a recognition that the Cold War was over and there was an attempt to try and uh, build it into an alliance that would be relevant to those issues. Then 5.11 occurred. Uh, the uh, Article five of NATO was invoked and suddenly we found in our, ourselves in Afghanistan. So in that sense, uh, it was a departure, but it was article five of NATO itself that triggered our presence in Afghanistan and our reaction to that event. Sorry. Thank you. And I wanted to ask, um, what role did the 1999 operations in Kosovo play specifically in the planning for the Afghanistan mission two years later? Do you see a connection there? No, I don't really, uh, Anish, because you'll recall that, that the uh, Kosovo uh, uh, mission was, was an air mission. 
and we provided air cover and, and active. That was the only thing we provided in, in, in connection with Kosovo. Uh, whereas uh, we provided no CF-18s in Afghanistan. And so in a way they were quite, they were very operationally, very different missions. I would say that uh, one area you're gonna mention international law towards the end, uh, one, one difference that was striking, of course, was that uh, in Kosovo, uh, we were in present without a United Nations sanction of a certain article uh, of the uh, Security Council, whereas uh, the, the mission in Afghanistan was sanctioned by, by the United Nations. So there was a legal framework there that was, that was different. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that the. Uh, I would say that the two missions were, were were so operationally different because of their nature that I wouldn't say one of there were lessons learned, particularly from one to the next. Yes, for sure. So, in your memoir entitled "Call of the World," which is brilliant, by the way, you at one point note after the U.S. invasion of Iraq that, and I'm quoting here, at a NATO foreign ministers meeting in Brussels on April third. The serious strains in the transatlantic relationship were evident from the raw nerves around the table. Canada, continuing our traditional role as a linchpin, tried then and during the coming months to bridge the gap between the Europeans, uh, between the Americans and those in Europe who were opposed to the war. So given the divisive politics around the invasion of Iraq, did you perceive any spillover effect on NATO's unity vis-a-vis -vis ISAF and the operations in Afghanistan? And were there ever any interoperability concerns? Well, there's certainly, well, interoperability issues is, is, a, different, is a different matter, but uh, the, no, in terms of the politics of the Afghan mission, the, uh, the uh, split between uh, NATO members as to whether they approved of uh, the Iraq mission or not, uh, didn't spill over to Afghanistan, but I would not, uh, suggest by that that it was not difficult. It, it was, I, you mentioned the, the Brussels summit. At the Prague summit, it was the same. I mean, my colleague, Joshua Fisher, made a couple of remarks. I remember in Colin got quite offended. Uh, there were still statements being made, sort of asides. Uh, there was a sense that uh, uh, Javier Solana and uh, Joshka and the Europeans were on one side and Jack Straw and Colin Powell, et cetera, were on the other. So, so there, were, there were kind of uh, definite, uh, definite uh, tensions there, but uh, it didn't extend to an agreement about the nature of the Afghan mission, I wouldn't say that. But it didn't, it didn't help, uh, that's for sure. And because part of the problem was, uh, and this didn't relate to Afghanistan, but related to Iraq, was that the United States was anxious to have NATO engaged in Iraq, uh, even in a training matter. But this would have meant then that certain uh, NATO officers of member countries who were opposed to Iraq would have been sent to Iraq whether they wanted to or not. So there were some complexities there that were for certainly raised issues, no question about it. Okay, so one recurring critique of our mission in Afghanistan is that it exhibited elements of a kind of confusion or listless list, listlessness, uh, both in terms of the internal ideas within the government of where the mission should go and how it ought to be brought to a conclusion, and also sometimes with regards to communication with the public. So did you ever feel that the articulation and clarification of our strategic objectives in Afghanistan were lacking from the outset? No, I don't think, uh, I mean, if you look back, on the history of it. Uh, don't forget that our mission there took place in various, in phase, different phases. The first phase was when we went over with the original invasion of Afghanistan. We arrived really too late to be of any significance, but uh, the unfortunate uh, friendly fire incident occurred where four of our troops were killed by American fire, which was very, a very regrettable incident. The next phase was ISAF, if you like, in, in uh, Kabul itself, uh, which was a limited mission relating to that. And then, uh, then our rather enlarged and more significant mission in Kandahar. So all those phases, each one of them were kind of different uh, 
in, in their nature and, and what they called for. I mean, you mentioned operability issues. Yeah, there are always, there are always operability issues. Uh, I don't know if you've read the recollection to Rick Hillier, but, but General Hillier, who served in Afghanistan, had, had quite tense relations with the uh, British, or rather the German Lieutenant General, who was his commander. And there were, so there were, there were always, in all multilateral uh, missions, there are uh, operability issues that relate to different cultures of militaries and, and making them work is, 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 is an effort in and of itself, which by the way, is one reason why Canadians are regarded quite, quite uh, favorably in these missions, because we kind of come to tend to come to them without a, without a lot of baggage and speaking both French and English and uh, as sort of conciliatory can, can work with, uh, with everybody rather well. So uh, Canadian officers are often very mu much sought after in these multilateral relations for that reason. With the benefit of hindsight, could you discuss the efficacy of our whole of government approach to the war with reference especially to the three Ds of defense, diplomacy and development and the role of the provincial reconstruction teams or PRTs in, reg in regional peace building? Well, yeah, let me let, let me go back to the last question because uh, th these two are, are related. I mean, um, as I said, all of these missions were different. I think ISAF and our our our, our activities in uh, in Kabul was fairly self-contained. We knew what the mission was uh, and it was conducted uh, and ended very much as planned. So I would have said that uh, there were no surprises there. Uh, it turned out that there was uh, perhaps uh, somewhat more violence than one had originally planned. Uh, when I visited, I described in the book how I went and uh, had some concerns about the quality of, of the materiel that our troops had to meet possible danger, which they had. So there were perhaps more dangers than we foresaw, but it, the mission itself was accomplished and accomplished well. The, the mission in Kandahar, of course, was of entirely different kind. Uh, to begin with, it involved the establishment of the PRT. Uh, it involved the, then uh, beyond that, it involved the provision of the, uh, of the uh, FAT task force, which was commanded by uh, Canada in the beginning and then by the British subsequently and the business of, of uh, NATO being involved in, in that whole area. And there, there you get into a whole host of, of different considerations, which I described in the book, uh, partly yeah. Afghan politics itself, uh, the wish of uh, President Karzai, which he often expressed that uh, NATO would be engaged in the South more than just the Americans. There was sort of a perception that it looked like an American invasionary force, if you like, instead of a truly multilateral uh, effort. And so uh, by Canada, Britain and, and, and the Netherlands agreeing to take on the three provinces we did in the South with a, with a NATO role, uh, was very favorably received by, by President Karzai, the Afghan authorities, but also by the Americans themselves who recognized the, <clears throat> the nature of the geopolitics of it, et cetera. So um, I would say that when we went into that mission, uh, we, had pretty, we had pretty clear vision of what we were going to do. Uh, and we just, I describe it in the book. Uh, and I think General Hillier says it was, you know, we were going to, make war in the hills and make love in the towns was sort of, he has much more colorful language <laughs> than I do. Uh, and, but it was that recognition that there was a dimension to it that was uh, pro providing security, which would be highly risky and by conflict. But also then the second but important part was the more traditional peacekeeping of security in the villages and then the development, the, the enable of development. And that then leads to the whole idea of the 3D concept of defense, diplomacy, and, and uh, development. And there, uh, 
you could say, uh, in terms of the mission, uh, it was not that successful in the beginning because it was sort of top heavy on the defense side, if you like, partly because of the personnel issue, uh, as I described in my book, the terrible, unfortunate death of Glenn Barry, who was a wonderful uh, foreign affairs officer, uh, killed in, a, in a, an attack on a convoy that was he involved in, made it obvious that you couldn't just send uh, diplomats and CETA officials down into Kandahar uh, willy-nilly, that, that there was a, a real uh, issue of security and things that had to be considered. And it really wasn't until uh, the Manley Report, when uh, Mr. Harper was uh, then prime minister, uh, the uh, battle which was led by David Fraser was over. Uh, there was a recognition of the need to reorganize and make, make the uh, mission more of a whole of government mission. And therefore it was in a way, I don't say it was taken away from defense, but when I was there, it was very much run out of national defense. Uh, after the Manly Report, there was a recognition that it, to be run, it had to be run out of central office, it had to be run out of the Privy Council office to make it a whole of government. And that's what happened with uh, David Mulroney and his role and uh, the role of everybody changed quite a bit. So I wouldn't say that the mission changed, but the, the, but the concept of, uh, of, a, of the 3D concept became better involved. Um, but the same challenge of what General Smith in his book calls war amongst the peoples or Atreus called the three block war or any of those terms remained the challenge. And so there where you got the changes was this, was it the nature of the mission changed because what the Taliban did changed. So when the Taliban adopted their their tactics of IEDs and blowing up our vehicles on the roads. In many ways, uh, our whole concept of reaching out to people and being on the ground close to them made it too dangerous. And so suddenly, instead of uh, instead of the Lab Fours and, and rapid response vehicles that Hillier and I had envisaged when we originally conceived of the mission. We replaced them, we needed tanks. Uh, we needed to use helicopters more to get people around for the forward operating bases. And so the whole nature of the operational requirements changed and that changed the dimension of the mission for sure. And I'm glad you mentioned the expansion into Kandahar because now I would like to discuss the expansion of our Canada ISAF mission beyond Kabul in 2005 and 2006. What factors motivated our national decision to take on the major responsibility of Kandahar province in the south of Afghanistan? And it was, of course, the organizational base of the Taliban and a notoriously difficult sector to secure, as you just mentioned. Yes, well, I mean, we had, we had many discussions. Uh, uh, I would have come in uh, as Minister of National Defense in the middle of this, David Pratt, my predecessor, had already been in discussions about where we might go. There were various uh, possibilities. Herat was suggested as one in the west of the country, was rejected because it was uh, for a whole host of operational reasons. Um, but it was felt that uh, the Kandahar mission uh, was felt to be appropriate, partly because uh, we were to be joined in that area by the Dutch and the British. And there was, a, there was this ability of us to work together under the NATO flag, but the Dutch, the British and the Canadians had, as I describe in my book, sort of similar psychological rules of engagement, such that we had a similar concept about how to approach uh, these sorts of missions, which require uh, perhaps a heavy hand on the security side, but a light hand when it comes to trying to aid development and bring bring uh, security to, to to people and allowing the uh, allowing the uh, the development of society to take place, and uh, we had similar ideas about how to do that. 
So there was a synergism there uh, that took place. You do, you point out that, uh, that uh, Kandahar was a very challenging uh, place for us to go. Uh, I obviously, uh, it turned out to be more challenging than we had appreciated it at the beginning. There's no question about that, but as everybody, the fog of wars always uh, produces surprises. Um, I, where I fault myself uh, in respect of Kandahar is that we should have thought more about the problem of the porous border and the role of Pakistan. I mean, it wasn't just, it isn't just us. I've just been reading Barack Obama's memoirs and in it, he says the same thing. He said the duplicity of the Pakistani government, their support for the Taliban, unknown really to us when we originally went in. As I describe in my book, I had meetings with General Musharraf, everything was going to be, we're all going to cooperate, everything would be fine. Although he quite said that uh, the, the Northern territories were ungovernable as far as he was concerned. Uh, so that, was a, a signal of, of problems to come. But we didn't really foresee the fact that uh, the enemy we were dealing with could retreat across the border and come back again refreshed, and to some extent even aided by the certain of the Pakistani authorities. So there was a lot of challenges relating to the porous border that if you look at the theory of, of insurgencies and how you contain them, it pretty well always, one of the key things is you have to be able to close off the area uh, from, from in, outsiders coming in. And that was never the case in Kandahar. So that was a real challenge for sure. And something we perhaps uh, might have been better, uh, better served to have analyzed on our own rather than relying on the NATO uh, and our allies in terms of uh, in terms of kind of a theory of what we were trying to do in the area. Yeah, thank what, you. If you, look at it, if you look at it, certainly the dimension of what we did in Kandahar had various dimensions. As I said, there was the dimension of the, of the politics of, of Afghanistan itself, which was very positively received. But in NATO as well, it was very positively received uh, uh, by everyone. And... So there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, on behalf of everybody about us being involved and also uh, the way in which we were going about doing with our Dutch and British colleagues. Thank you, that was really insightful, especially the parts about uh, the insurgency theories that you mentioned. In our report yeah. on, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, as I say, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you say insurgency, but I mean, it's even broader than that. I mean, the Pashtun people are, are on both sides of the border. And when you look at the role of Pakistan, uh, President Obama at one time made this crazy statement that in order to solve Afghanistan, we have to solve Kashmir. And it was, what on earth is he saying? But basically what he was saying was that uh, Afghanistan and it was, a, was a factor of the rivalry between Pakistan and India, which of which Kashmir is the focal point. And so most of the troops of Pakistan were located on the Indian border. Uh, and that was their enemy. And in fact, anything they could do in Afghanistan, which would upset India, they would do. And so we were the prisoners, not only of the Taliban and their policies and what they were trying to do, but the subset of, of Pakistani of Indian rivalry and how it was playing out in Kabul and who was getting ahead of doing what and whether or not uh, our success or lack of success would contribute to, to their aims. So this was a very complicated, many layered chessboard we were playing on. Yeah, I think it's important to take note of uh, wading into some of those regional dynamics that had existed for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I added to that was, of course, this, as you know, as General Musharraf said to me, he said the Duran line, they didn't even recognize the Duran line as, the, as an international border. They just said, oh, that was just something the British drew in 1896 or something. And, you know, so so there were a lot of factors there that, that 
that uh, that one like anything in the world you get involved in, you get involved in local history and the local problems, and you have to be sensitive to them as part of your finding solutions to the problems, for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. So in our report on Canada's involvement in Afghanistan by scholars David Ferguson and Jack Granitstein, they argue that we went into Kandahar not only because it was the correct and courageous decision, but also because we wanted the world to know that Canada had arrived back on the international scene. They name you and furthermore state that Bill Graham had concluded in the latter part of his tenure in foreign affairs that the soft power human security agenda had failed to increase Canadian influence in the world because the Canadian military had deteriorated so badly. Finally, they bring attention to a piece that you wrote in May 2008, where you quoted Frederick the Great in saying, diplomacy without armaments is like music without instruments. So yeah, that, was, that was perhaps a little, a little cheeky of me to quote Frederick the Great. I mean, although, although uh, when one talks of war, one, one does talk of uh, various other authorities for sure. But I think uh, I'm not in any way belittling what Lloyd did because he, he was an extraordinary foreign minister and what we achieved with the, the Landmines Convention, the International Criminal Court, uh, so many issues uh, was very important, but they were basically soft power. Yeah. And we didn't, when, when there was a problem in, that required the military support for a United Nations or another uh, initiative, our military were not we're not uh, in a position to respond to it. And actually when Paul became prime minister, uh, he said to me at the time, he said, because it, he said, you know, well, I want you to stay in foreign affairs, but I'm not leaving you there forever. And uh, I should have seen that coming. But so when I went to defense, he, when I, he asked me to be the defense minister, he frankly said to me, he said, when I was the finance minister in the nineties, we cut very badly into defense because the budget we had to. Now we have to rebuild it. And I want you to be the architect or one of the architects of that rebuilding, uh, which we were, and we were managed to get uh, the single largest uh, defense budget increase uh, the, the department had ever had. So that was a very satisfactory moment in my early part of my career as the defense minister. But we did have to build up our capacity for sure. And I and I think that's I think it's true today as well. Uh, you can't expect a country like Canada cannot expect that if it is going to be a significant contributor to peace and security in the world, if it is only contributing to one dimension to that peace and security, it has to be willing to step up and do the heavy lifting in the hard places as well. If it's going to have both the credibility and the ability to project its interests and values, so. It's getting the balance right. Another way I put it was that I felt that uh, maybe we were like an airplane where uh, we were running where the we had two motors on one wing and only one motor on the other wing. And we needed to balance that a little bit better. Was big. It's, it's it's all a question of balance in life, like like everything. And that was what we what we felt we had to do. And there's no question that Kosovo uh, before that Bosnia. Uh, and the missions that, the, that, that our soldiers have been called upon to do had, had quite exhausted the department and it required a rebuild and a rethink for sure. So did you ever get a looming sense of mission creep during your time as foreign affairs minister or later on as minister of national defense that we were taking on more responsibilities that, than we should have? Well, yeah, there's always mission creep in everything you do. So, you know, somebody says, oh, mission creep, well, yeah. No, there's no question about it. Um, so going back to my original point, the first mission, no, it was over. The ISAF mission, I wouldn't say there was mission creep. We went there, we, we built that wonderful Camp Julian, we, we created the stability we had to do. Uh, our role was, was, was well performed. We were highly respected for it. Uh, our soldiers did a great job uh, in Kabul and we left uh, and it was over. So the real mission creep issue revolves around the Kandahar mission. And there, uh, 
I don't think it was so, I wouldn't put it so much as mission creep because the object, the object of the mission was to uh, provide security in the first place and then to provide development assistance and diplomatic assistance such that you would get civil society redeveloped and, and, uh, and, and you could develop, uh, build dams and schools. And so, so if you look at Kandahar, uh, in the beginning, as I said, it was maybe mainly too defense oriented, but then as it developed with a whole of government, uh, CETA stepped in and, and the role was played where we had, we had, uh, we were able to p- build schools, hospitals and dam and the, and the famous dam, all of which made a great contribution towards the, the local economy and the well-being of the peoples. Uh, we were able to provide training for the police uh, out of the, uh, out of the uh, PRT in, in Kandahar. Uh, and that was, that, that's not to be neglected, you know, particularly the fact that we had women police officers there. Uh, there were some women police officers in, in, in the local area. They were just thrilled to have Canadian leadership and the, the demonstration that women took leadership roles in police. So there was a lot of very inspirational activity taken in all sorts of levels. Uh, and at the level of diplomacy, we worked hard with the local governor and other governors to, to provide civil d- development of civil society. So yes, uh, that sort of mission uh, aspect of the mission was there. Uh, when we sent the soldiers, uh, when we sent, uh, and this again was when Mr. Harper was prime minister, but we planned this before, uh, before our government fell. Uh, but when that, uh, when that mission went with David Fraser and the battle took place that was so well known, um, that was not, that was part of the game plan. So that's I wouldn't call that mission creep. That was a real recognition that we had to get out and, and do that. Where I think you could say the mission creep took place was our inability to get out the way we have. And as I in my book, I really I very much uh, fault fault is perhaps not the right word, but ascribe a lot of the issues this to NATO because. Uh, the other members of NATO, we were not able to find somebody to replace us. And certainly the concept of the mission, when we, when we started it was, we would go there for two years and then be replaced by somebody else and would conceivably go back after two years after that. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no, but we would be replaced and that would allow us to then uh, refurbish, uh, operational tempo would be resolved. But as you know, we stayed for 10 years because nobody could replace it. In that sense, it was whether you call it mission creep or whatever, it was a definite, uh, uh, a definite issue of the, of the mission being far beyond uh, what one had ever conceived of in the beginning. But we're not alone in that. Uh, the Americans are still there. Uh, and I noticed again, going back to Mr. Obama's book, I mean, he was, they were planning to get out when he was president. And uh, they're still, Mr. Biden's still trying to stuck with whether they've got to try and withdraw on a certain date or whether they're going to keep people there. So uh, in that sense, the mission has been a mission creep for everybody that's been involved in Afghanistan. Yeah, so you, you notice the, um, the kind of length of the mission, and, and if you want to call it mission creep or not, but uh, we can now talk about some of the broader implications especially with your intimate knowledge of the subject about the international legal implications. So I'd be interested to know your thoughts on how international law evolved as a result of our intervention in Afghanistan and what new precedents did our mission there set? Well, I don't think that, uh, that's a very complicated question. Uh, uh, If you look at someone like, Oh, some of the recent books, I, uh, just uh, a recent text that I would highly recommend uh, is David Kennedy's book, Law and War. He's a Harvard professor. Um, to begin with, without getting too much into the details for our audience today, I mean, there's the sort of general concept of the law of war, but then there is also the law in war. 
And uh, as far as Afghanistan was concerned, uh, it didn't raise the issue of the legality of the operation the way Kosovo did because of the United Nations resolution. So uh, in that sense, it, it uh, was not evolutionary in terms of international law. It was consistent with uh, international law, our operation there. Uh, the, the more complicated issue is that in recent times, uh, with the development of the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court and the uh, whole concept of international humanitarian law, the rules that govern the conduct of uh, operations and what soldiers do or can't do, don't do in their operations has become much more complicated. And all the, all the books will tell you that uh, General Dallaire, who I had at Trinity College as one of my guests, emphasized so much the problem of ambiguity and the problem that leaders have in trying to understand that. And you have to understand that, for example, our, uh, our uh, forces in Afghanistan often uh, well, would usually be accompanied by a legal officer who would be looking at whether or not operations were consistent with our international legal obligations. And I had to sometimes remind people like, uh, uh, like Donald Rumsfeld, my, my American counterpart, that Canada was a signatory to the International Criminal Court. And that circumscribed certain things that we could or couldn't do, whether we liked it or not. I mean, he would call these caveats, but that I didn't say, this is not a caveat. This is, this is a constraint that international law has placed upon us. So uh, you have to look at that. And uh, all operations today of uh, armies, whether they're British or American or ourselves or, or, or the Indians or any of them are very much now governed by these whole, very sophisticated uh, concepts that have developed really, as they say, over the Rome Statue and international humanitarian law. And I would say overall, uh, I, I'm very proud of our troops of being consistent with that. And, uh, General Matinchuk and other, other high-ranking officers of our military have always emphasized the fact that we operate by the rule of law. And I believe that we did. There is the one issue of the detainees, which I think you might want to raise, which, which gave rise to a lot of very thorny uh, problems, some domestic legal issues, both domestic and uh, international. But overall, I would say that our, the conduct of our troops uh, in Afghanistan was impeccable in terms of international legal rules. Thank you. It's good to have that expert's uh, point of view on these things. So, well, I, my expertise yeah. is a long way away. <laughs> it's been a long time since nobody would listen to me as a law professor. So <laughs> don't, don't take it too seriously. <laughs> Well, as a, a current U of T student, I still feel obligated to treat you like my professor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very kind. So lastly, I'm curious to know your views on the Afghan peace process as it is currently unfolding today. Obviously, this is a region that you've had to learn so much about. This is a fascinating part of the world that we invested 13 years, numerous lives and billions of dollars into. So are you dismayed by the prominent return and the longevity of the Taliban? And what kind of hopes do you have for the future stability of the country and the citizens there? Well, I'm not, I'm obviously not as informed as I would be if I were still in government, but just my general reading and looking at what's taking place, it's, it's very obvious that if the purpose of this mission was to create an Afghanistan, which women would be free to be doctors and television presenters and a civil society would be developed in Afghanistan that would uh, be respectful of what we would consider to be uh, international norms of human rights. It, it, that, that is threatened by the present uh, Taliban resurgency and the fact that it's, it probably is going to take over the government in the next while. I mean, the Americans are going to leave. Uh, the Afghan authorities are not strong enough to stand. They'll have to have a, a government which will either be a, 
coalition government, but one can sort of see uh, the uh, one can see the uh, the writing on the wall in terms of the strength of the Taliban. So a lot a lot depends at the moment, and we can't foresee this. The extent to which the Taliban itself has changed in the last twenty years uh, and has developed, because uh, it too will have changed and have a perception of governance that will be somewhat different. I don't see a Taliban coming back and blowing up the statues in Bamiyan the way they did the last time. This is not a similar movement as it was at the time. That, that said, uh, it clearly will not be something that we thought that we were going to construct when we went into Afghanistan. And in that sense, it's, it's a significant disappointment. But it's up to the Afghan people in the end, it's their country. Uh, they have to resolve these issues. Uh, and they're a proud people with a long history. Uh, they will have real problems because in many ways, the strength of the Taliban is in the Pashtun part of the community. and The Northern tribes of the Tajiks and others are not so uh, welcoming to that whole concept. So they'll have real problems within the country of trying to struggle with getting the right balance. So uh, we haven't seen the end of this movie yet, that's for sure. But let's, let's hope that at least when I think back, talk, when I talk to our troops and they were so proud of what they were doing and so, so feeling that they contributed to making lives better, uh, I believe they did that. Uh, I believe that some of that will stay, not perhaps in the way we hoped, but something. And in the end, what you can say about our mission, however this, however this ends in Afghanistan, at least the Canadian mission was one that was driven by the right values and the right interests and had the support of our population and our troops, and they did an amazing job. So we can be very proud of that, regardless of the end result. I echo those statements. As somebody with Afghan friends and acquaintances, I think your remarks are on the money. So Minister Graham, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. It was a truly enlightening retrospective on Canada's involvement in Afghanistan and the war on terror. So, to any viewers out there who are interested in learning more about Minister Bill Graham's career and his time at the helm of Canadian foreign affairs, I cannot recommend enough his memoir, Call of the World, written in 2016. I used it partly as the basis of my research for today's interview, and I found it a thoroughly engaging and accessible read. So Minister Graham, oh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Anish. <laughs> I, I wish you well. I wish you well with your studies, and I wish you well at the NATO Council. Well, Minister Graham, I wish you all the very best in your upcoming endeavors and my wishes for your health and well-being. I look forward to any future appearances you may have for us here at the NATO Association. Thank you very much. Thanks once again. Be sure to follow us on our social media channels for more interviews, articles, and analysis on all things NATO and Canada. This is Anvish Jain, signing off on behalf of the NATO Association of Canada. <laughs>